All right. This class, the theme of this class is healing, as you all know. But even more important than this, um, it is to heal yourself first and then to show you how to heal others. This is quite different than other psychic classes because this one absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt can be done by everybody. And it doesn't take the guts or the bravery that some of the other psychic abilities do. The only guts it takes is saying to somebody, can I try? And that's easier than to do a reading. And strangely enough, it has been downplayed over the years, and yet, by far, it is the highest form of psychic, meaning mind discernment and spirituality. It is the highest form. And why it's been held up for so many years, Possibly it's because people just didn't think they could do it. It's another one of those bad press releases from society, <coughs> culturally and medically, that only certain people can do it. And that's wrong. Anyone who has a desire and wish to and knows how to protect themselves can heal. There's certain things that you have to know. And one of the first things we're going to talk about is the knowledge of how to take care of ourselves. Okay? The origin or the history of healing goes back farther than anything medical we know. And if you went to more primitive countries, you would know this, um, such as the shamans, the witch doctors, the healers, the herbalists, the natural medicine people. And now what's really strange is we're getting back to the holistic. Because modern medicine, even though I work with 70, you know, 76 doctors, are saying there are things we just don't understand. And because we're so far advanced, not only are we living longer, but we're also getting more complicated. And no longer are you going to find the old family doctor who pats you on the shoulder and says you're going to be all right. And the reason for that is all of us. Not necessarily all of us in this room, but because if people didn't get all right, then they sued the doctor. And that's a tragedy. And that's what has caused the poor bedside manner. Now, some of that had to do, of course, with the fact that the doctor, if he's really honest, had to make back his tuition fees in two years. Because it's very exorbitant financially to become a doctor. Now, in no way are we replacing medical. In no way should you ever tell someone that they, that you are taking on a position of replacing their doctor. What you want to be is another addition, a handmaiden to, a help aid to the person. Like I said to people who are sick, who are worried, who are frightened, who have illness, try it all. Because I believed in miracles before the Course of Miracles ever came out. Because I see miracles all the time, what people might call miracles. In the physical body, you have the power, and we know this to be true, and I don't know why we never carried this farther, to rejuvenate our cell structure, to fight off illnesses through our right count, to run a temperature to burn illness out. We have almost all the natural ingredients in our own system to fight off illness. But because, and I'm going to say something now that you might take offense to, but listen to me as we go through this class and see what you think. The only reason we get into health problems is because we can't control our thoughts. 
We do not know how to protect ourselves nor control our emotions. Now, isn't this funny? We know this on certain levels, and we are so stupid, all of us, we never carried it any farther. If any one of us in this room gets emotionally upset, and it's overt, or even covert, we know that it gives us headaches, stomach aches, it just knocks us out, doesn't it? And we all know that. Have a big fight with somebody you love and see how you feel. Go through a death or a grief situation see how you feel. Now we know that every single person will nod and say that. Yes, yes, that's true. Why can we not know then that the truth carries farther? That insidious things also work us over. We carry things so long and we get sick from them. The mind gets sick and the body follows suit. Now we've always thought of a sick mind as someone who has to go to a hospital and be put in Thorazine or put in a straitjacket or shock treatments or any of those other things. And we never think to stop anything or do anything about it until we're already in there. And that's why I've said to so many people who come to me, I always call myself the last ditch effort because I come in the rooms that I've been everywhere else and now I'm here, which is so depressing. <laughs> Not that I wanted them to come to me first, but come to anyone first to find out what you can do as far as preventative, as far as you can go for neutralizing. You see, I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that man was meant to live and breathe and have certain illnesses, sure, but to get, be able to neutralize, get rid of them, and go on with their life, and when it came time for them to die, to more or less step out of their body and be able to go. Now, why I know this to be true, when you go to Africa or Egypt or Mexico or some other primitive places, you never ever see any person who is dying of anything riding around anywhere. People simply, when it comes time, like the Eskimos, go out on the glacier or go off or lie down and die. The more sophisticated we become, the more agony we seem to put ourselves through. Now I'm finding out more and more, and I'm sure you're very cognizant of this, that cures are becoming more painful than the illness. Now I'm not against anything, but I'm telling you right now, this is my opinion, that when people have to take a lot of chemotherapy, and the chemotherapy is worse than the cancer, there is something wrong. Because now people are fearing that more than they're fearing the actual illness. And every time I've ever talked to anybody who has a cancer phobia, I say to them, why do you have it? They say, because look what it does. Look what they do. Look what happens to you. And the body has no defense then. And if you're on a lot of antibiotics continually, you break down your whole immune system, and then you wonder why you walk around feeling like hell and catching everything. And because you've been programmed. Now that doesn't mean I want you to, if you have a flu or whatever, that I want you not to have an antibiotic. But people are constantly putting something in their mouth. They're pills for everything. To sleep, to wake up, to get thin, to put on weight. We got, we got everything. And we never think to stop the bladder infection or the kidney infection before it starts. We never stop to think that our plumbing is stopped up or we're constipated because it has to do with someone in our life that's constipating us or situation. The first thing I want you to do is to start going over your body tonight. I want you to think about and write down on a piece of paper any aches or pains that you have in your body, chronic or acute.
and wherever you have had a problem or surgery in your life, even if you have an allergy. You know, almost like you were filling out, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, they give you those lists, you check the boxes, and and what I hate about it is, they almost program you. Do you have diabetes in your family? Well, then. Do you have cancer in your family? Well, then. Have heart trouble in your family? Well, then. And now they send you out cards that say, high risk. I had a woman at Danza whose mother and sister had died of cancer. And she was getting three months red letter cards through the mail. Saying you better come in, you're high risk, you're in the 90%, whatever. I said, write on a piece of paper and send it back. I am adopted. <laughs> And he quits on the cards. Now the person who is adopted, I've had people in my reading room, the doctors just shake their heads and say, well, you know, we don't know. Because we don't know what your genetics are, so it's, you know. And then you feel like you're out there on a little tiny boat made of paper out in the middle of the ocean. You don't know what you're going to get. While you're writing or thinking, and boy, I don't care how much memory we lose, we never lose the memory of our ailments. Did you ever know that? <laughs> we can tell you one, what year it was, what month it was, we had our surgery. You ask a mother, or even a woman, what time her child was born, she won't remember that as well as she'll remember when she had hemorrhoid surgery. And I've heard people, boy, the summer of 77, did I have chicken box. <laughs> boy, in the spring of 84, did I have a gallbladder surgery. I mean, they know exactly. Now, acute problems, and I want you always to think of this, not only for yourself, but other people in which you may treat or help. Acute problems that come on very fast. Well, always, 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 always a trauma that has appeared quite suddenly that brings on an acute problem. Now, we have this magnificent word medically that we use for everything that is a catch-all called stress. Well, let me tell you something in case you haven't relayed this to your doctors. And if you don't do, life is stress. And not everyone should not be stressful. Some people need stress. Not everyone is the same. And women continuously say to me, I don't know what to do with my husband. He's so stressed. Well, make him quit his job, stay home, and then he will die. Did it ever occur to you how many people die after they retire? because they are so used to being on a treadmill that if they stopped, it's too much of a shock to the body. And people retire and have no conception of what they're going to do. Now, a person who retires and then knows what they're going to do doesn't die. But a person who quits their job and says to you, I don't know what I'm going to do, and wanders around and reads the newspaper, dies. Notice that if a person that you know gets an instantaneous cold, you say, what about flu? I don't care. It can be flu, cold, I don't care if flu's raging. Ask them what recently happened in their life that they came down with this head cold. Instant trauma usually hits right in the head area. If it goes on too long, it shifts from the head to the throat to the chest area, to the stomach, and anywhere else it can find a weakness. Because let's face it, whether you realize it or not, all of us have a weak spot in our body. Whether it's our lower back, our neck, our right ear, there's always a weakness. We all know that. And why don't we strengthen that area? I don't know. 
stupidity. I don't think we knew we could. I don't think we knew how to do it. And yet this world now is filled with mind over matter, consciousness movement. We are God. We are like God. We can do anything. And yet we don't know how to heal ourselves. I started to say this to my group last night and I saved it for the healing class. You don't move around. You lie down all the time. You sleep excessively. You poke around and drag your feet. You never smile. And your mind says something is wrong here and it will incur something to be wrong. Because the mind is a fantastic programmed part of the physiological body. Part of the soul too, but it still has to reside in the physiological body. If you don't move and you sit in front of the TV, or your husband and your wife does, your mind will eventually say, he has not moved for three and a half hours. He must be dead. <laughs> and the body starts dying. How many times have you been sick, feeling bad, down, whatever it may be, and you force yourself, and you have to force yourself, to get up, to fix your hair, to comb your hair, to move around, to get in the car, to do something? And for some strange reason, you feel better. People always say, and you've heard this for as long, I'm sure, as I have, colds and flu and sickness and everything is worse in the morning and in the evening. No, it's not. It's not any worse in the morning and in the evening. You know why it is? Because you have more time to think. And the more you think about yourself, the more you fiddle around with yourself, and people say, oh yeah, but if you don't take time to lie down, you're going to get sicker. I'm telling you right now that's wrong. Unless you've got double bulbar pneumonia, you're much better on your feet. And hospitals are understanding that. I don't know if you remember in my day, but when you had a baby, you were down flat for 10 days or two weeks. Now you have a baby, drop it out, you're up the same day walking around, and you're so much better for it. But do we carry that into our life? No. You see, the whole idea of many doctors is go home and go to bed, which means to them, to them, in case you haven't figured it out, don't bother me. If you're in bed, lying down, you're not going to be up and around and coming in my office again bugging me. So you've got to move around. Now, I don't mean with a raging um, fever and, like I said, double bulbar pneumonia and two kidneys inflamed, but you're not supposed to go to I say, well, so we said, I'll just keep walking. <laughs> but we really, really are babyfied. And our bodies have a way of saying to us, not so much that we are running and doing and working, but what kind of mental stress are you carrying? You can work long hours. God only knows I do. It's the stress that kills you. It's what goes on with you mentally. You can work 16, 20 hours a day. Our pioneer forebears did. But how do you feel about it? Now, you are going to a job that you hate and despise, or marriage you hate, you despise, or a kid or somebody that's driving you crazy. 